then you're gonna pull she, you're gonna pull her coffee down too. Yes, I will. For practice, <laughs> he came for practice. <laughs> it was awesome, very cool. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So good to see all of you on a brisk Sunday morning. You know, the one thing I love about first service is that when the sunlight comes in and it shines, if you can see this, it shines a reflection through the window of the cross on the wall. You don't see that at the 1030 service, but when you stand up, you just take a look at it. Or just come and look over Kim's shoulder. She won't mind. Don't worry. <laughs> She'll think everybody's coming up to drop a dollar in her basket or something. That'd be all right. That'd be all right, too. <laughs> but I love that because that always, as I sit and listen to Pastor Gene talk, I think of that, the reflection that we're supposed to be. Amen? Amen. Every time I see that, that's why I love this service, a reflection of Christ to those around that we encounter. That's what we're supposed to be. They see us at the foot of the cross. Amen? Let's stand up this morning and proudly proclaim with thanksgiving that we can lean on the everlasting arms of our Savior. Father God, as we come into your presence today, Father, we, we confess with our lips of your everlasting arms. Father, we confess with our lips your glory and your majesty. And Father, on this day, we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 It is great to see everyone this morning. Uh, please grab a bulletin. There's some uh, different announcements in there. Somebody told me that tomorrow is Valentine's Day. Whoa, 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 whoa. One me. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> so, since I heard that tomorrow was Valentine's Day, I walked up to Gary, and I sat down next to Gary, and I said, will you be my Valentine? And Gary... <laughs> 
his response was, well, I guess so. It's the best offer I've gotten. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't quite make my heart go pity pat. <laughs> but I guess if I'm the best offer you got, that's good. I don't know. So meet and greet this morning. Go around, find somebody that you want to be your <clears throat> valentine and, tell, and ask, oh, look at all these lovey-dovey couple. Come, no, somebody else. Go, <laughs> Sam, <laughs> Sam, will you be my valentine? is an awesome God. Amen? Amen? I hope we take time to pause throughout our week to reflect on that. I love the words of this next song. It leads right into where our hearts need to be, and it speaks the truth. I have days that I lose the fight. I try my best, but I just don't get it right. If I had to guess that it describes each one of us in here, and that's all right. I talk a talk that I do not walk, and I miss the moments that are right before my eyes. May our hearts recognize that we need to be less like us and more like Jesus. Amen? Mm -hmm. To see those moments where people are hurting all around us, where someone just needs to have their hand held, someone needs to have someone walk up alongside them. As simple as that, 
to be more like Jesus and less like us. Father God, it's good to be in your presence this morning. It is good to gather with one voice to lift up praise to you, thankful for the everlasting arms of Jesus that we can lean into each and every day. Thankful that you are an awesome God, reigning in power. Thankful, Father, that you know we struggle and stumble as we strive in our walk and our journey to be closer to you. But, Father, we want to be less like us and more like you. We want to have more mercy like you. We want to show more grace like you. We want to show more kindness, goodness, love, and faith to reflect the love of our Savior to those around us. Father, we draw near to you this morning in this moment, thanking you for who you are and who we are in Jesus Christ. Coming to you, Father, with our open hearts and open minds to hear your word clearly this morning. Father, touch us where we need to be touched. Shake us where we need to be shaken. Father, draw us to you, not just today, but each and every day, so we can reflect Jesus to those around us. We love you. We thank you. And all of God's people said, amen. amen.
love that. When I can't see past myself, it's so easy to get caught up in me, isn't it? When we are surrounded by a world that we are supposed to be hands and feet, a little more like living everything I preach. May that be our heartbeat each and every day. So let the redeemed sing of his promises with our lives, to pour out our thankfulness with our lives, letting it overflow so people will see a difference in us, that we are changed because of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. He is our deliverer, and we are living in the freedom of our risen Savior. Amen? Thank you for leading us in worship this morning. Uh, could you put up the picture from Wednesday night's uh, praise practice rehearsal? 
Uh, this last Wednesday at praise practice rehearsal, we had a, we had a visitor. Uh, Kim was able to bring Matt by uh, while praise practice was going on. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Uh, first time Matt Cameron's been back at church since last, last March. Since last March. Uh, Matt was, was sitting there and he, he looked around and, and Matt, he's just looking around and he looked at me and he said, man, it's good to be back. <laughs> it's good to be back. Uh, praise God. Please continue to keep uh, Matt lifted up in your prayers and Kim. Uh, please keep Dan and Christy in your prayers. Christy uh, has an appointment tomorrow with the uh, oncologist here uh, to discuss treatment options. Uh, please keep them in your prayers. Uh, Kathy Cummings had surgery last week. I ask that you continue to keep Kathy in your prayers. And Kurt is having knee replacement on Tuesday. Uh, and I've made Kurt the same offer I've made everybody else, that I, I, I was willing to do the surgery for free, and he turned me down. And I was going to be an anesthesiologist. I got to spray Kim Rook. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Kurt, Kurt, you're a smart man. <laughs> please be with, uh, please keep Kurt in your prayers as, as he undergoes surgery on Tuesday. Uh, Jay Pipkin also had foot surgery this past week. He is home and is doing well. Uh, please keep Jay in your prayers. If you have prayer requests, if you'll lift them up to the Lord. Thank you. Oh, Father God, Lord, it is so good to be in your house on your day with your people. Father, it's just, it's right. It's just, it just feels right to be in your house on your day with your people. Father, I, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. Lord, that we have the privilege of journeying on this journey of faith together. Father, you, you have placed each of us in each other's life. And Father, I thank you for that. Lord, we do praise you for the healing that has taken place. Father, we thank you in advance for the healing that is going to take place. Father, for each of our loved ones, we lift them up to you. And Father, we, Father, we ask for your divine presence. Oh, Father. Father, even more than the physical healing, Father, we ask for the healing of each and every one of us in our spiritual life. Father, as we come before you this day, Father, we confess before you the condition of our heart. And Father, we, we ask your forgiveness. And Father, we thank you. We thank you that you love us over and beyond and above our shortcomings, Father, you love us. Oh, Father, thank you. Thank you that your love is not dependent upon our actions, but your love is totally dependent upon your nature. Oh, Father God, thank you for that. Father, we, we thank you for the privilege of worshiping together today. And we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. <clears throat> Tomorrow's Valentine's Day. You all know the story of Valentine's Day? I don't know if I've mentioned this before or if you remember or if you knew it on your own. The, the story of Valentine's Day. According to church legend, there was a priest 
in the year A.D. 269. A.D. 269. There was a priest by the name of Valentine. And the Roman emperor at the time was Claudius. Emperor Claudius. And Emperor, emperor Claudius had a, a descriptive nickname. His nickname was Claudius the Cruel. And that tells you all you need to know about Emperor Claudius. People called him the Cruel. Among other things, he wanted everybody in the Roman Empire to worship the Roman gods. And anybody that refused to worship the Roman gods, he would have them executed. He also, in his twisted brain, he wanted, a, as you can imagine, for the Roman Empire, he wanted this huge Roman army. However, he believed that the army would be better if it was all volunteer. He didn't want people to be drafted into the army and then, you know, they'd have a bad attitude. He wanted everybody to just volunteer for the army. But there was something that was getting in the way of young men volunteering for the army, and that was young women. They'd get married, and then they wouldn't want to volunteer for the army because they had a wife and maybe little kids. So Emperor Claudius outlawed marriage. That way, all the single young men would, well, I don't have a wife or kids, I may as well join the army. <clears throat> this priest named Valentine refused to worship the Roman gods. And this priest, Valentine, continued secretly to perform marriages. And, as you know was going to happen, he eventually was caught performing a Christian marriage and he was thrown in prison. And he was told if he would repent of his great sin and if he would worship the Roman gods, he would be set free. And, of course, he refused to do that. One of his prison guards had a daughter who had been married by Valentine. And this prison guard would allow his daughter to come and sit outside the priest Valentine's jail cell and talk with Valentine. And again, as the legend goes, on February the 14th, if you kind of put the calendars together. On February the 14th of the year A.D. 269, as Valentine was about ready to be executed for his crimes, he wrote a letter and gave it to the prison guard to give to his daughter. And in this letter, you know, he gave some wise counsel to this young lady, and he ended the letter with love, Valentine. And that is how we have today, Valentine's Day, celebrated on February the 14th. And that's why we give Valentine's. I, do kids still do that? Do they still give Valentine's to each other? Uh, Scott, did you do that in grade school? Did you take Valentine's in and give it to all the all the young ladies in your class at T Couple Grade School? Yeah, they told them I was young. <laughs> <laughs> that was the thing. <laughs> <laughs> did it work? <laughs> Uh. 
<laughs> I, I know, sometimes I ask myself, why did I do that? <laughs> I, I know, I, I'll have to look up troll dolls. <laughs> uh, One more story, and then I'm going to get into Scripture. One more story. And again, legend. And keep in mind, legends might be true, okay? They may or may not be true. But legend has it that during World War II, some German soldiers went to a house and Christianity had been outlawed, and there were some Christians meeting in what's called a house church because the churches had been closed, and so the Christians were secretly meeting in a house. And so there was a group of Christians together in a house having a worship service with the doors closed and the windows shut and the curtains drawn, and all of a sudden, there was this heavy knock at the door, and the door opened up, and, and some German soldiers came in with their guns. <clears throat> and the German soldiers said, we're going to kill everybody that's a Christian. If you're not a Christian, you can leave. As you can expect, some of them left. Second time, the German soldiers with their guns drawn said, we're going to kill every one of you that's a Christian. One last chance, you can leave if you're not a Christian. And a few more left. Now there's just a few left. The German soldiers shut and locked the door, put their guns down, and went up and hugged the Christians, and the Christians are like, what's going on? And the German soldier said, we too are Christians, and we had to make sure that the only people that we allowed to know that we're truly Christians are fellow believers, and so we had to get rid of everybody else. And we just wanted the true Christians to be left. And I read that story and I was like, wow. Wow. What would I have done? And then, because I think about you all, I thought, what would you all do? What would you do? And then... My mind went to Acts chapter 9. The book of Acts chapter 9. This is the story of the Apostle Paul and his conversion experience. Paul hated the Christians. Paul was going around gathering up Christians and putting them in prison, which is kind of what I got to thinking about the story about the German soldiers. Paul was going around to different places and saying, are you a Christian? Yes. And he'd take that person and put him in prison. <coughs> we also have the story of Stephen being stoned to death. And, the, and Paul was there. He was involved in that, in the murder of Stephen for being a Christian. But in Acts chapter 9, this is where God got a hold of Paul and changed him. Starting with verse 10. I want to start in Acts chapter 9 verse 10. Paul has been knocked to the ground. The voice has spoken and, and, and Paul said, who are you? And the answer was, I'm Jesus that you're persecuting. And Jesus told Paul to get up and to go into Damascus, which was about 200 miles from Jerusalem, 
He said, go into Damascus, go, in, go into town, okay? All right, starting with verse 10. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here am I, Lord. And the Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints. At Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And after laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he regained his sight. And he got up and was baptized and took food. And was strengthened. Let's talk about Ananias for a second. The priest Valentine continued to do what he knew was right, even though he knew it was going to cost him his life. group of Christians are in a house having a worship service. If you're not a Christian, you can leave. Those few that left, that, that remained, that were left, they knew that those German soldiers were going to kill them, but they were willing to stand up and say, I'm a Christian, even if it cost me my life. And now we have the story of Ananias. Let's not overlook the fact that Ananias was faced with losing his life. Ananias was a Christian. Paul, or as he was known earlier on, Saul, had a reputation for imprisoning, torturing, killing Christians. And Ananias is in his house. The rumor has spread. Saul is coming and he's going to round up all the Christians. What do you think the advice given in church that Sunday was? So, do what? Lay low. Lay low. <laughs> in church on that Sunday. Hey, everybody. Saul's coming, and he's going to round us all up and throw us in prison, and we'll probably die. Lay low. Maybe that's what was said. I, I don't know. But the rumor had been spread, Saul's coming, and everybody had fear, those that were Christians. Rightfully so, they had fear. So Ananias is... is a strong Christian man. He's in his house. And he has this vision, this voice from heaven says, Ananias, go present yourself to Saul. In other words, tell him you're a Christian. Go pray for him. Lay your hands on him. Pray for him. 
And I imagine Ananias, I, I, and I'm putting things into his mind, and I, I if I was Ananias, <laughs> I won't put it into Ananias' mind. If I was Ananias, like, you want me to go pray for that guy? I'll pray for him. Lord, kill him. <laughs> right? I mean, but Ananias, God says, go pray for him. If you were Ananias, what would you do? You want me to publicly profess to be a Christian in the face of this hated Christian killer? What did Ananias say to God? In the scripture I just read, what did Ananias say? Put it in your own words. What did he say? <laughs> God, are you sure? God, don't you know who this is? God, you're... I mean, let, let, put yourself in Ananias' position. Would you have just jumped off the couch and said, yippee, I get to go? No, none of us would have. I mean, we all would have been like, oh, God, are you sure? Are you sure that's what you want me to do? That sounds kind of dangerous to me. I mean, I, I can picture myself saying, okay, God, I'll do it, but I got to know for sure this is you talking to me. I got to know for sure this is what you really want me to do because the consequences. <laughs> so, God, if you really want me to do this, I'll do it, but I'm not too excited about it. Haven't you been in that position before? God's told you to do something and you agreed even though you weren't too excited about it? <laughs> I mean, I can think about some times in my life when probably, I guess, the times that stick out are the times I did something wrong and God told me to go fess up and make it right. And I was like, I really don't want to. I think I can get away with it and not get caught. <laughs> And God's like, no, you got to go make it right. You got to man up and fess up. And I'm like, oh, okay. But I wasn't real thrilled about it. It's going to cost Ananias potentially his life. But Ananias did it. Ananias went. knocked on the door and said, is there a man in here named Saul? Yep. And Ananias walked into that house. Are you Saul? And Saul, blinded, was like, yes, I am. I can just picture Ananias Taking that deep breath, saying, okay, Lord, I hope this is right. I hope this is you. Because if not, it's been a good life. <laughs> Lord, I hope this is right. And Ananias reached out and put his hand on Saul. And what did he say to him? What did he say to him? I got... Verse uh, b -b 17, verse 17. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, he said, Brother? Really? He called him his brother? How could he call him his brother? Because they had the same dad, that's why. But what if Ananias is wrong? By laying his hands on him and calling him brother and saying the Lord Jesus, what has Ananias just done? Uh, he's in 100% now. There's no turning back, right? 
There's no getting out of this now. I mean, he's 100% committed now. It's not one of those halfway kind of a deals. Well, I'll true this, but I'll have a chance to know. When he called, he laid his hands on him and said, Brother, the Lord Jesus, he is all in. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. How could Ananias do that? How could he do that? The only way in my mind that Ananias could do that was because he was in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, we... we I think in the church today, we don't say that often enough. Even as I said it, it's almost like it, it doesn't quite sound right. He was in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll serve Jesus. I'll be a warrior for Jesus. <laughs> I'm in love with Jesus? Somehow it just doesn't sound right. And that's sad that our society has done that to us. But Ananias was in love with Jesus Christ. Pure and simple. He was in love with him. So when Jesus asked him to do something, Ananias was like, okay, I'll do it. I trust you. You tell me to do it, I'll do it. On a human level, when you're in love with somebody, don't you do some things that you normally would not do? <laughs> when Susie and I first started dating and we fell in love, can you believe I went to a dance? <laughs> I went to a dance. I went to a dinner theater. I went to a school play. I mean, what's wrong with me? I would never do that kind of stuff. There's no way I would have done that kind of stuff. But I was in love. Did you know that God has sent you a Valentine's card? Think back to when you were in grade school. I assume they're all pretty much the same other than the troves. <laughs> <laughs> Valentine cards I remember as a child. Will you be my Valentine? And I, in, my, in my class, there were 33 of us from first grade through eighth grade. There were 30, 33 of us. So... Anytime you took something, I had to have 33 of them, right? Or 32 of them, right? So before I left home on Valentine's Day, I had to have 32 Valentine cards. I mean, that's kind of geeky. I mean, that's weird. That's, Mom, I don't want, and she said, shut up, you're taking 32 of them. <laughs> okay. So I'd pass out 32 Valentine's Day cards, but you know what? There was always that one special girl that I would make it a little personal. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'd, I'd pass out all these Valentine cards because, you know, you got to give everybody one. So here's a Valentine's card. Here. But for that one girl, I'd underline, I will you, and I'd underline you, and I'd draw a heart. And I'd write a little something extra in there, like, I love you. Do you love me? Yeah. I mean, did you all do that kind of silly stuff? No? Of course not. Oh. If you'd have seen some of the girls in my class, you would have, baby. <laughs> Guys, God has sent you that personal Valentine's message. God has sent you a personal.
personal note of love. It's not general. It's specific. God has sent you a note. And God has said, it's God speaking, I love you. And he's asking you, will you be mine? Will you be mine? Father God, I come before you today. And Father, I thank you. Father, I thank you for the silliness of Valentine's Day. I thank you, Father, for the message of Valentine's Day. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Father, that you have sent your people a personal message, a message of love. And Father, you have asked us individually, very specifically, you have asked us, will you be mine? And Father, whether that takes the courage of Valentine, the priest, if it takes the courage of those Christians in that house church in Germany, if it takes the courage of Ananias, Father, I pray that each one of us will respond to your Valentine's Day message to us. Because, Father, I do believe you are speaking to each one of us individually. And you are asking, Father, each one of us individually, will you be mine? Oh, Father God, I pray. Lord, I pray. It is my heart's desire that each one of us will respond Yes, Lord, I'll be yours. I will be yours. Oh, Father, I pray this in the very bottom of my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you please stand?
Father God, I pray your blessings. Father, just as Ananias said yes, Father, I pray that each one of your children here today will say yes to your message of love. Father God, I pray your blessings upon your people today. In Jesus' name, amen.